Policy Curriculum Committee meeting, which was duly noticed, there you go, on March 15th, 2019, through posting a notification to the press in accordance with Wisconsin 19.84. Health message. So we just brainstormed a health health message, and now that the weather is warming up, uh, you've got kids on their bicycles, um, and they have, have, are not practicing any sense of caution. And so please be aware that there are kids out, and that um, that they're not looking for you yet, or maybe never. Who knows? <laughs> so just be aware of that. Okay. All right. So first on the agenda is to adopt. Uh, the uh, the uh, meeting agenda. Do I have a so long. second? Any discussion? Okay. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed. Okay. All right. Board member compensation study. So um, you, I hope you all had a chance to look at uh, the memo that um, Steve Huth and I worked on, and. Um, and so what we're here tonight is to decide whether or not uh, we move this forward as a policy. If we move it forward as a policy, Dale and I are going, I'm sorry, Commissioner Thompson and I are going to get together and write a policy. And so it's not necessarily a done deal. That would still have to be approved, um, uh, you know, once we, once we do that. So, um, so, you know, I, I'm going to open this up. Um, uh, well, first, we, we, it's an action item. Um, and so do we have a motion to um, move it on to the uh, full board as a policy? You mean the draft? Well, the, we can talk about what would be in the draft, but I need a motion first and then a second, and then we can talk about it um, and, and see if the draft moves forward. Or you can make amendments to it. I make a motion. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Um, open it up for discussion. What do you think? I'll start. Okay. Um, um, the... Some of the data that I looked through, there really was no clear data saying whether a board per diem does or does not encourage more people to run or diverse or whatever. I mean, this, the data is simply not out there, pure and simple. So I, I think it's a question of um, do we support a, a board per diem or not and hope that indeed it would draw more people running for office, whatever. Um, I, with mixed emotion, would support, um, would support um, a board per diem with certain stipulations. Um, I indeed would support a board per diem with certain stipulations, which would be number one that uh, it would not, it would only apply to people that are elected after a year from this election. Uh, so that would exclude four of us because the fifth person would be up for election again. Uh, that it would not be. Um, effective until the 2020-21 budget. I would um, suggest something nominal because the intent is simply offset expenses, whatever. So I would suggest something nominal such as $2,400 a year uh, with the board president getting 3000 I echo Dale's, um, I would want it from a, a year from now. I think that's, I would also want to include language that you had recommended in your written summary of somewhere in the policy as to how to refuse that compensation mm -hmm. if you were a board member, even after the one year 
had gone by. I would like to see that in the draft. When you looked at the summary of districts that paid either an annual stipend or just a meeting stipend or both. I think that's something that could be talked about. I don't know if some districts did a mix where they did the a certain dollar amount for being on the board plus a, an additional stipend per meeting. I don't know where everyone's at on, on that particular, but I saw that some districts did both, correct? That's true. And so um, the recommendation I got from uh, almost all, all of the the board uh, members that I talked to, and I talked to uh, or got emails from about ten of them, and mm-hmm. we select we selected comparable um, districts, and they all they all recommended an annual stipend that um, and that uh, maybe you know like maybe paid monthly. So if somebody quit. Um, you know, uh, that that, it, that they, they wouldn't uh, obviously have benefited by it, that it's on uh, like an auto pay kind of situation. So we're not talking about um, a lot of extra paperwork, that every year members get a chance to the, to refuse it mm-hmm. um, and, uh, and uh, you know, and that sort of thing. The, the conversation that I had... Um, they said, you know, that the the money didn't make people run, but it certainly helped out. Um, and um, th- while they they claimed some diversity on their board, um, they couldn't necessarily attribute that directly to the diversity on their board. But um, but if you, as, as we were going through the data, what we noticed was that there were was a little bit more, whether that is the result of the stipend or not. Right. Maybe, maybe yeah. that wasn't measurable, but right. it was something that you saw as just... That, yeah, it's anecdotal um, more than anything. Um, it is, uh, I, and I, I personally agree exactly with, um, you know, what Commissioner Thompson was saying about it not being um, uh, applied right away, wait a year, and then those folks that are elected next year uh, would be in the cycle. And then we cycle every year um, so that those of us who are making this decision now uh, will not necessarily benefit, benefit by term. it until our term is yes. up, and then um, and then I would add one other thing that if if this does go through and and if we do write this policy, that there be a um, that there would there be some sort of an automated um, process by which um, the stipend is increased. You know maybe based on CPI or something like that similarly but um, but so that we are not so it's just automatic and we're not um, we're not making decisions on our salary again so that it's taken out of our hands of course the right to refuse will always be there at least in the, the way that you know if we if we write this policy I, I think we're probably all pretty agreed that if we do write this policy that uh, that would be part of it any other uh, comments or what does the city council for Janesville pay right now anything nothing Nothing. and how many board meetings do we have per year I see in 2019 there's 22 on the calendar I know typically July and around the holidays at least one a month comes off, right? So maybe down to 19, 18, 18, 18 meetings a year. Committee so meetings. So 18, and, and then, the and then meetings committee spell. meetings, some committee meetings, yep, are in there. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't I, I don't support taking this, and, um, and I know that that's an option that everybody would have, but especially when we can't, you know, when there's a textbook that are 10 and 15 years old. Um, but... And I didn't see anything compelling in your research to even push this forward to the board to say that we would get, I think the goal of doing any research was to say, would it get more people to run? That was not what you found. So I don't support moving it to the board. Um, I think those are all my questions. Thank you. Any other comments, Carl? I think you're doing the right thing, but I would probably change 
a couple of things. First of all, the average is $3,170. Uh, the median, half above, half below, is $3,100. And we're proposing $3,000 for the president. Okay, and $2,400 for the others. And I'm kind of, I'll, I'll throw a little switch in there. I think that might be interesting to look at the 2400 or a monthly stipend of 200 is fine with me. I would like all officers to receive 300 additional for the year and the president 600. We're pretty much the same. But I look at what Greg does, I look at what you do, and I look what uh, Steve does. And there's a lot of work put in extra and just as much as the president, maybe not as much as you do. But I'd like to see a little extra there. Um, I do agree that nothing says it did move people to run. But I didn't see something that said it didn't move them. It's kind of half empty, half full. Uh, I think it's worth a try when 95% of the districts do. By the way, a little information of the city council went to do it. And because of public opinion and some other things in that, and I talked to them, uh, they backed off. They really did want it. And they felt when the school district did, they would go for it too. Uh, may change, new members all the time. I would do one other thing. I wouldn't put it into effect until the third election cycle. That means everyone has gone through an election, and once the third is done, then everyone receives it if they want it. That's my suggestions. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So it's interesting. Um, I mean, um, you know, in the commentary that we had, um, it, you know, we, it said some did, however, indicated it may help with child care expenses for some individuals. Um, you know, nobody, I don't think anybody really runs for this, uh, for um, a salary, even in places where they do offer I wouldn't even, you know, a significant salary. So places like Kenosha, um, which I think was at sixty five hundred, if I remember right, or something like that. No, they don't, they don't run because of it. Um, but what they, what we discovered was, well, and and I, and, and the first question I asked every school board um, president I talked to is, why do you offer it? And I heard um, several times from people that the reason why they offer it. Um, and although it was it was a decision made before they uh, they might have been president um, or even on the board was because uh, the attitude is is that the work is valuable and and it is a lot of work um, especially for the president uh, the board president spends a lot of time um, uh, a lot more time perhaps than um, than we do and um, because we val because it's important work. And to show that uh, we value the work, we provide some compensation. And that was, that was a, a pretty much a common um, attitude that uh, I received. Um, the, only, the only one that did not offer compensation was um, Appleton. And I asked their board president uh, why? And she says, we just never have. And she, it just was one of those things they just, they just never did. So really didn't have a reason for it. Um, uh, but she didn't, you know, she said, I suppose probably because they're, they're fearing, um, backlash, but, but it was more like just, uh, tradition than anything. So, um, Any other thoughts? Thank you. I'm, I'm not a member of the committee, so I don't have a vote into whether this goes forward or not. So I'll just give my opinion. Um, I, I won't support uh, a policy that includes monetary compensation for board members. Um, I think that's what attracts me most to uh, the Janesville board is that we, we do it as a voluntary and we're providing a service for our community. Um, I think that what makes us most unique, and I, I'd rather see other boards consider not compensating their board. You know, if they don't have a good reason why, um, I just, the value I get from 
again, providing the service uh, to my community is uh, immeasurable, and that, that's why I do it. You know, when I see the children show up here and, and present, that's the value I get. And um, I'm, I'm grateful that I have, uh, you know, a wife <laughs> that supports me continue to do this. Um, I don't think the president really does any more work than any other board member. I think it's up to each, uh, each independent board member to determine how much time and effort they want to put in. I mean, it's an open, open book. How, mu how do you much do you want to be involved? Um, so I'll, I'll just leave it at that. I just, and idealistically, I think fundamentally, even though we're not talking, well, we are talking a lot of dollars if it's up towards $3,000 a year. To me, that's the fundamental reason a lot of the problems we have in politics is the money involved. And I, I'd really like to see James will just stay out of that game. So thanks. Oh, but I have the other one on too. Now I got both on. Um, I agree kind of with Kevin. I do think the board president does more work. But as Kevin points out, he, he or she will do as much work as they want to do. I understand that. Um, my big concern was, two big concerns were um, where the money was going to come from and, of course, when it would go into effect. Um, I guess my reason for getting on the board was the community service thing, too, you know. So, and Lord knows, public servants aren't overly well paid, you know, but... Um, I guess at this time, I, I wouldn't be in favor of paying the board either. So, thank you. Any other comments or considerations? And that, uh, I appreciate what they're saying. And it's an individual thing whether you want to accept it. You're talking a total with nine members for the year, less than $3,000 average, and that's 27,000 a year. And it'd be less because some wouldn't want it in that uh, as such. I don't think it's gonna create a political atmosphere for the amount of less than $3,000 a year. I don't see that. Um, but I think it's also showing respect to the people that take the time. I've done community service in Janesville and never received a penny for years, for almost over, well, in the 50 year range. And I'm grateful for that and I enjoyed doing it. But not everyone is retired with a fair pension and that, uh, which is fine, that's a personal thing. But there are people out there I believe that would run, even if it's only one e a cycle in that, that having money for the babysitter and gas to get here, each of these, because there's other meetings than just a committee meeting. There are meetings for the board, for the committees, and all the different things you show up for, the visits to the schools, a variety of things. So nobody's asking to get rich on this. They're just being want to be said, thank you for doing it. Here's some help. Others don't need that help. And that. So I guess that's all I really want to say, and I appreciate the opportunity to. I'm not on the committee, but I like being able to say it. Thank you. I think I, I think what you're speaking to is the privilege that some people have that others don't. And, um, and those people who don't have privilege, um, maybe because they don't have um, any other support or, uh, you know, are on their own, or whatever, um, you know, they have um, they have something to share too, and uh, you know, and so so part of me uh, leans toward um, accepting this because it might encourage those other voices that um, oftentimes don't have the privilege of service because of other obligations. 
um, uh, uh, Commissioner um, Murray, don't talk to me about money and politics. <laughs> <laughs> I understand exactly what you're talking about uh, in that respect, but I don't think it's about I don't think it's about what they earn. I think it's about all the influence peddling that goes on as a result of it. Um, so, uh, but uh, but I appreciate your concern about money and politics. So, um, so you know, I I. Uh, I don't know if we have anything else to say about this. Um, this is, and uh, um, Commissioner Thompson, do you have something to say? Go ahead. Well, I just want to make it clear um, for people that have mixed emotions about it, I'm not supporting this for myself. I'm thinking of the future board members that are running. So um, I'm, supporting, I'm supporting the motion that's on the floor. So the only thing I would add is, it, it might seem like 27,000 is not very much, but when we've got, there's a, a wish list of things that we have to say no to every single month, you know, for the budget reasons. And I can't, I, I'm with Kevin on this. I don't do this at all for any recognition besides getting to be a part of shaping the district that my kids are raised, being raised in. And um, I might not need the money and I might not need a sitter, but there's a lot that we can do with $27,000. It might not seem like very much in our big budget. I understand that, but there's things that we say no to all the time that we need to, I don't think we, um, I think there's plenty of opportunity for people who want to be able to do this. They're, they're going to find a way, a compensation of $3,000 is not going to sway anybody. And we didn't find that in the research, which was the whole purpose of this. Any other last comments? Okay, now who are my committee members? Because I got all this. Okay. So, <laughs> right here. Us three? Yeah. It's just us three? Okay. Yeah. Four. Four. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Because there's a lot of people at the table here. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Yeah. All right. All right. Any other comments? Okay. Let's see. And then I'm going to call the question. So... So the motion, could, would you mind reading it back for us, Dem? Sure. Commissioner Herta moved, seconded by Commissioner Thompson, to develop a policy for board member compensation to move to the full board. Okay. So is everybody clear about what we're going to be voting on? So we're talking about moving it to the full board. And then if we do decide to do this, then Commissioner Thompson and I will sit down uh, and, and write it out in policy form. Okay. Okay. Um, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Nay. Okay. So it looks like we move it on to the full board. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, Mr. Garner. Sure. I want to be in your room. There we go. Good evening. Um, I'm very happy to share with you the overview of our uh, 1920 staffing plan for the school district of Janesville. Uh, I have to tell you, um, with with Michelle Call leaving um, and working with Mandy Harper, it's been it's been a real pleasure. She's really picked up a lot really fast. Um, we've made sure to uh, dot every. I and cross every T. So we're going to take a look at this. And so that's, that's what our work is tonight. Uh, the plan itself is it's done. We just have to put it together in a booklet. So I'm just going to do the overview for you tonight and then you'll get that sent to you soon. Uh, back in November of 2018, uh, I always come to you in the last three years, I've come to you and say, okay, board, we're, we're, here's your board policy. These are the TPR ratios. Uh, is it okay that I start working on the staffing plan based on your board policy? And that's exactly what this is right here. Uh, so we have K3 of, of a TPR 1 to 25, grades 4, 5, 1 to 30, grades 6, 8, 1 to 30, and then at the high schools, it's 1 to 32. So that's based on, so when students enroll in a class in the high school or middle school, just so you know, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, but the, the bottom is 20. 
and so we meet with the high school principals and the middle school principals. And so if kids sign up for class and there's not 20 kids in that class, then we don't run the class. Uh, and so we've done all of that work already. We've met with the middle school, high school, and elementary principals to, to work on that. Um, and just so you know, that's what this plan represents. The bottom, uh, every year I ask Mr. Pennington, what is our average teacher salary? What's it cost the district? And it's gone up. But for a couple of years, it stayed the same at 74 and change. This year, it went up to 75,193. That includes benefits, salary and benefits. So that's the average that we use. So when you hear me later talking about contingencies, um, that's, that's the number that we use when we talk about contingency. Uh, in the same token, um, the average hourly cost of what we call support staff or paraprofessional is $18.48. That also includes any benefits related to that, but that's an hourly rate. Question so far? All right. Um, I met with uh, Commissioner Myers uh, a while back when we set up the agenda, and she asked us to take a look at the historical um, average of our TPRs. So what I pulled for you, uh, and again, because we do this at the high school, we meet with the principals and we know, with, with some exceptions, if they're capstone classes, for example, they might run under 20. But with very few exceptions, we know that the, the ratio at the high schools are going to be 20 or higher. At the middle school, the same thing. We'll talk about the middle school programming here in just a second. But what you see there is the average overall elementary TPR for the last five years. So in 15, 16, we had one teacher for every 21 kids. 16, 17, one, one teacher for 20.8 kids. Don't worry, they're all whole kids. It's just, <laughs> just an average. Uh, as you can see, we go down 20.6, 20 20.4. 20 this year, we're at 1 to 20.5. I think what captures people's attention many times is are those hot spots. And what we call a hot spot is when they come within five kids of adding a section. So, for example, if we look at K3, and I'll see if I can go back here just a second. If we go back, we have a section, say, at Adams, for example. Um, this is just an example in second grade and they are currently uh they're they're showing or projected uh, enrollment of 45 kids in that second grade for example they would be considered a hot spot because we might get an influx of five or more kids which would put us over that one to 25 ratio and i would have to consider then do we add another section to make sure we follow the board policy is that making sense okay so right now, if we look at uh, the current hotspots, we have several. There's actually, um, there's probably three that you'll see when, when I present to the entire board of hotspots, but none of them are to the point where, obviously, if we had to add a section, we would add the section already, but we call those hotspots. We call them really hotspots, meaning it could sway either way over the summer. And I watch that very closely. Um, and if necessary, we shift. If I see a decrease in enrollment at one school, projected enrollment, say for example, I added that third teacher at Adams, but I see that that enrollment isn't inflating anymore and actually is going down under that 50. And we're seeing an influx of kids over at Van, Bur Van Buren, for example, over a section. In order to save the district and me having to come to you to ask for more money, I would just shift that position over in the summer. I work with the principals to do that. We did that on three different occasions this year um, prior to the to school year starting. We try not to add sections once the school year starts because that's disruptive for, for everyone. Okay. Okay, so let's get into the numbers. As you look at our student enrollment staffing plan to staffing plan. So this year to next year, our projected enrollment at the elementary level um, is 3,858 kids. That's a change, a decrease of 72 students. As a result, based on where those students currently fall in all the schools, 12 schools and all the sections, we're looking at a three, a decrease of three FTE at the elementary school. Okay. At the middle school, we have a current uh, student enrollment projected for next year at 2,204 kids. That's an increase from last year of 33 kids. Okay, now you're gonna see that that teaching FTE change from last year, or from, well, it's this year, 
to next year is 4.3 FTE. And I can explain why that is in just a second, because obviously we're not uh, 33 kids doesn't necessarily warrant four full time teachers. At the high school, uh, we're seeing a, a pretty large decrease as you look at that. Our projected enrollment for the high schools is 2,847. It's down 172 from this year. So next year's enrollment will be down 172 kids, which as you can see then results in a decrease of FTE of 6.08. Okay, questions so far? All right, so overall, our enrollment is down 211 kids. We believe, hopefully, uh, based on the research we've done, um, you may have heard uh, Angela Lynch talk about our birth rates a while back at a uh, last year or so. We know that the birth rate is pretty low and we might be close to the, the bottoming out of that. And hopefully we'll start seeing some increases in, in students attending the school district of Janesville. It's just the birth rate and it's not just us, it's, it's across the state. So we're experiencing that, that low right now. This is an overall kind of summary. So overall, this staffing plan proposes a, a decrease of 4.78 FTE, okay? And I'll talk about how that all works because I know many of you are familiar, but some of you aren't. So I'm gonna review that again here in just a second. We go through each of the categories. Um, the teacher staffing change, the local budget, the impact is uh, minus 4.78 FTE. We have uh, broken out there the local budget for EL teaching staff because we have different grants that pay for some certain parts of these positions. P4J is no change, title is no change. Special education is a, a minus one FTE for special education. That's typically, that's a grant funded position. That's not a locally funded position. So just so you know. And then of course we have the paraprofessional staffing that's increased uh, 7.0 hours per day. Okay, so let me go back. Um, let's take a look at, and that doesn't present well, but I, I can send this presentation to you. Let's go back to that teacher staffing change, the minus uh, 4.78. If you recall, a few years ago, we ran into the situation where it was actually more, a lot more than that. Uh, and the board was concerned. I remember Commissioner Quirk asking if we've been, if we, she was sitting right here, I remember it like it was yesterday, uh, asking if we had talked, uh, obviously, to to the staff and the union about what, what to look for. Uh, at that point, then we did go back and talk with the union and, and discuss those pieces. One thing that I can tell you is that uh, we are going to do our best uh, to not, uh, to not non-renew someone. And how that works is I will have all the principals in one room and we'll talk about where all the openings are and we'll talk about what subjects they are and we talk about who we can shift. So for example, if we have a high school English, this is just again, an, an example, high school English teacher, certified secondary, that can move down to the middle school to teach language arts and or literacy, we would be able to do that as long as the licensure fits. So they might be, there might be a, a reduction at the high school, but they would move to the middle school and not lose their position or lose their job with the district, if that makes sense. So we will do that on a large scale. Uh, we have middle school teachers who are certified elementary who could move down or move up, depending on, on where the holes are, but we will try to patch all the holes so that we don't non-renew people. That is our goal. And one of the ways we do that, and, and Commissioner Myers, you, you asked me to include the language and I sent you an email uh, earlier today, uh, we tried to do that through attrition. And I know that's hard to see, but I, again, I will see you. Attrition is when there's an opening through a resignation or retirement. Well, we knew uh, as of February 1st that we had retirements. We had nine retirements. Of those retirements, two of those positions were specialty positions and ones, ones that wouldn't necessarily be impacted by a classroom, for example, their they're itinerary, itinerary uh, staff. Um, what we're currently looking at right now is a way to um, fill those holes. I'm aware right now in my head of three resignations that already will occur. So we already have those positions that we can try to, if the licensure fits, we will try to uh, move the people into those positions. 
also, um, if there's special cases where we, you know, this is our first year of having that retirement timeline changed to February 1st, we're, we're wanting to know earlier so that we can do, do these types of pieces earlier. And we've been allowed to do that. I can, I can uh, talk to you about that in just a second too. But essentially we have nine retirements. Um, if someone were to come to us in a special case, um, we may consider allowing them to retire with their benefits even though it's past the timeline in, in an effort to save a position or from someone losing their position as a result of that. Is making sense so far? Um, we also then, we have to look at performance and um, uh, Superintendent Pufal and I are working on, on some language right now. I know that was uh, one of the things that we've been asked to, to look at, but this is what's in the current handbook. Uh, we have to look at performance and one of the things that we have to look at are the documented the verified and confirmed performance concerns if there's uh if there is a plan of improvement in that person's file then we would that would be under consideration if that makes sense and then we we finally look at the licensure obviously we have to have that person licensed to teach the subjects that we have available and if we don't if we don't have any other options then yes then that person would be non-renewed any questions You mentioned you're going to go through with the retirements, you know, same way you can move people from here to here with dual licensure, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, does staff have any say in, I don't want to move? Uh, historically, we do the transfers first and then, uh, no, not historically, they don't. Uh, if after this process is done and we see a need somewhere else, we, we may ask that person. And I can give you an example of that if I'm the principal at a, at a building, say Washington, for example, and, and there's uh, transfers have occurred and I've moved staff around, but then I have an opening in second grade, I could ask one of my other teachers if they would want to move down to that second grade position, which would then, I would then post their, their position, if that makes sense. We tend to ask them after, after the fact, once all these transfers are done. All right, and with the minus 4.78, mm -hmm. um, do you have any idea where the, are most of those going to be at the high school? Or how's that washed through so, in terms of, you know, you've got different yep. classes, different grades, blah, blah, blah. Let me go back. Me? Yeah, I can show you. Um, did I pass it already? I did. Hold on. Okay, so we know right now we'll have a, a re decrease in the elementary of three, three FTE. Right. Okay. Um, so we then we also know that the, the middle school's up. All right. And then we know the high school's down 6.08. So I think to answer your question, where, where are we going to see more non-renewals possibly? Uh, if I look at the numbers, we would look at the high school as that possibility. But again, we're going to get everyone together and try to shift people into positions. There's one other kind of stop gap that we've tried, and, and uh, we have two positions right now, I believe two, Edison uh, Innovative Specialist position that's currently posted, and we have the uh, ALC over at Franklin that's currently posted. Now, normally we would wait to post those positions to see how things kind of played out. However, I've asked people to, to post those now so that if we get someone hired into those positions, it could be someone from the classroom which then opens up another position that we can shift someone into. Again, as a way to stop non-renewing someone. Yeah, uh, could you, okay, so you've got the high school down 6.08 and then go back to the middle school one for me, would you please? Yep. So 4.3. Um, so, um, so people who have a secondary ed, um, certification can teach can they go all the way down to uh, sixth grade? It depends on their licensure. It, there's some that are 612, some are 712. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if we're talking about reading, that's kind of a unique situation as well. But it depends. So, so for example, I'm secondary certified uh, to teach life science and biology. So I could, I could move down to sixth grade and teach that, that particular class but I wouldn't be able to teach all the classes at like, for example, the elementary, because I'm not elementary certified. Right. That makes sense. Right. 
Um, so um, uh, you mentioned uh, the thing about um, offering the option for retirement mm -hmm. and that it's something that we just generally do here, um, but it's not written down in the handbook. Is that right? That's correct. And and part of the reason, and, and Superintendent Pufo and I have talked about this, um, we moved that deadline back. This is kind of the first year we've done it, so we're really, um, we really did publicize it a lot, but we understand that some people may not have realized it or for whatever reason missed that. So this is kind of a one-time piece. Uh, it's a special situation where, in fact, they maybe they didn't have their mind made up by February 1st, and they're kind of hovering and they see this and then they, they're like, oh, maybe I can save someone else from being non-renewed. That would be something that we could consider. But we really do need to know when those retirements are earlier so that we can better do our work here now with the staffing. Is there, isn't there a, a way to uh, put this into the handbook that might uh, delineate some of those conditions under which we might consider um, an option, uh, taking an option? I, I mean, we can we can certainly look at that. That's not a problem. We certainly we're looking um, working with our legal team to delineate some of that language that we talked about for non renewal this time. Um, just because I mean, I, I get it that you know uh, it's certainly much better to plan knowing ahead of time and everything else. But I think sometimes people there are also some life changes, mm -hmm. you know, yep. and um, that uh, uh, people did not know about um, at a deadline or something like that, sure. you know, that I think, happens. Yeah, I agree. I think one of the concerns that we have is we don't want to create an artificial date and to say, yeah, February 1st, but then we get an influx later on, which defeats the purpose of even having the, the deadline. Mm -hmm. So we want to be very careful in how we consider that mm -hmm. case by case. Okay. So just to expound on that, just as you might recall, the the notification deadline for retirement used to be April 15th. And based on the process that you just heard Scott describe, you can see how it was important for us to move that date up because it helps us to use retirements to, you know, put attrition strategies into place and prevent ourselves from having a non-renew. Because otherwise we're having to come to you by April to give a preliminary notice of non-renewal. And then after we've done that, we find out, oh, we have these retirements that we didn't know or weren't official until they're to us in writing. And so it's really important that that date is moved up and that it's um, taken seriously by the staff because otherwise we can't plan and it could result in people being non-renewed that don't have to be. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. And it's good to have. Um, and I like the, I like moving it up um, for that that very reason, um, but um, but but certainly there there are there probably should be somewhere in our language, you know, times that we might and and still leaving up to the district, but uh, be willing to accept something like that, you know. And I think that it should be part of our. I, I think it should be laid out, but um, but again, I I agree. I don't want to turn this into the wild wild west, you know. But uh, but there should there there are things that happen. Then if it could, um, and if it could say, uh, uh, result in someone not being let go because someone is able to retire, then that would be um, you know very helpful. I think. Yeah. Um, could you go Could you go back to the screen the the um, the, the uh, what is what's the screen the um, the 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 uh, attrition and you know your your thank you the layoff screen. There you go. That you had up there. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, um, so with uh, with Act Ten, we got rid of seniority, and um, and uh, there's there's no mention here of seniority, and I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking that at some point, um, you know, seniority should be in there. And uh, as one more layer. So, in other words, if you've got, if you've tried attrition and you've gone through that process, uh, and you've looked at um, the performance, and you've got two people that um, perform equally equally well and have the same licensure and um, and qualifications to take uh, another job, then 
why is it that seniority cannot be considered at that point? There are a lot of other variables that affect the ability for us to put the right best person in front of kids. So for example, in our high schools right now, we're trying to scale up the ability to teach dual enrollment classes. Mm -hmm. And so more teachers, frankly, don't have the credential because the higher learning corporation, which is not under our, you know, that's, that's a higher ed thing. And, and they've said, you have to have a master's degree either in the content area or a master's degree with a minimum of 18 credits in the content area to teach dual enrollment classes. And so um, some of our high school staff meet that benchmark and others don't. And our ability to, you know, that is an, an example of many that, that I could give that are things that we want to take a look at um, that go beyond seniority and beyond job performance being equal because if we don't have people with that certification, we can't offer those kids those classes. And one of our promises is to scale up 90% of our kids having dual enrollment or AP classes. So that would be an example. Mm -hmm. um, I could give many others. That I, I think that's a great example, but doesn't that fall, fall under the licensure and certification uh, qualification already. Wouldn't that be part of that? Is that what we mean? Is that not what not we mean? Not necessarily because they're licensed to do the job by the state standards, but the higher learning corporation requirements are separate from that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it just depends how you want to define it. So, okay. So, so let me, let me wrap my head here around this. Um, so what are we talking about? Um, any old job? Are we talking about those jobs that might require that um, that special kind? And the, using your example, that special kind of certification. Um, so let's say that we've got a garden variety English teacher's job, not one with dual credit or anything else. And I'm assuming that we're planning on having people that don't necessarily have um, certification for dual credit. We're not kicking everybody out because they don't have dual credit, right? We're not expecting everybody to be certified in that respect. No. Okay. And so let's say you've got a garden variety English teacher's job right there. And, um, and the licensure issue in this case is not even, uh, you know, really a factor. Is it, I mean, does somebody that would have that kind of licensure, um, uh, or qualification be, Given the given a, a leg up on that job, even though that job does not require that kind of certification. So you're asking. I just want to make sure I understand your question. If a current teaching assignment for a position doesn't include dual enrollment, mm -hmm. And you're comparing a person who has dual enrollment versus a person who doesn't have dual enrollment certification. Does that factor in? Yeah, even it, though the job does not require that. It, it could. It could. Okay. Because obviously the more flexibility you have, you, you don't know the following year what kids are going to sign up for for courses. And as we're trying to expand the number of kids in dual enrollment classes, obviously the maximum flexibility that comes along with that credential is important to us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm, um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to stop for now and let somebody else talk. Thank you. Let me first jump ahead a year or two. Um, because what we're talking about here is not just today, but tomorrow. Um, didn't you project that in a maybe one more year after this one, then we should level out and our enrollment should start increasing? That's our hope. Hopefully at least level out. I don't know about increasing <coughs> or not, because that, again, depends on the birth rate. But at least, you know, one of the reasons we're dropping a lot of kids next year is because this year's senior class is the largest in the district by a long shot. And so when they're graduating, you know, that's where we're losing enrollment. We don't have another class in the near term that's going to exit from our, you know, system and, and 
cause another drop. And so if the birth rate stables out or is, is stable on the, on the coming in side, we're gonna probably not necessarily be going up, but at least we should stop going down. But again, there's a lot of moving parts to that, housing and other things that we don't have control over. All right, and I guess the second thing, which I'm hearing um, Commissioner Meyer is talking about, <laughs> Um, was somehow trying to build in some seniority for some positions. That's really what I heard you saying. Um, that, um, and I'm sort of wondering that myself for some positions. Um, and I don't, I don't know how else to, to put it, but I understand where you're coming from. And then, of course, I... I understand where GEA is coming from, and I'm wondering um, if there isn't something in the middle. That's all I have to say. I mean, I, I do appreciate, I do appreciate the musical chairs. I mean, mm -hmm. again, is, we're trying I mean, to avoid this all together. And I mean, this is, uh, I incorporated this slide on the request you know, of Commissioner Myers. It's typically not presented with the, the staffing, but uh, I try to incorporate all the presentation together so that we would get as much information out there for you. I mean, you know, this is, I, I give staff credit for this, you know, maneuvering. Mm -hmm. Is there, is there more to your presentation? There is. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, real quick oh. comment on that. I'm sorry, I didn't realize that we were mid, mid presentation. That's okay. Um, Carl, go ahead and then. Um, and then I can wait till the end if that'll okay. make it smoother. Thank you. Sure. I apologize. All right. So you, you noticed uh, at the middle school we're up 4.3 uh, FTE, and there's, there's several factors for that. So this staffing plan incorporates several things that the board has chosen to do for the benefit of kids. Uh, one of those pieces uh, you know and remember very well is the, the music programming. We've added 30 minutes to the fifth grade music program in addition to the already 60 minutes that exist. We're also shifting uh, instrumental teachers up to the middle school, which allows uh, a larger breadth of experience for for the kids. Uh, it accesses more kids at the sixth grade level to experience uh, possibly music. Um, we also expanded our middle school course options. I tried to uh, look at the difference, uh, the number of course options that we have now compared to last year. And if you look, sixth grade's pretty regulated, but seventh and eighth grade, uh, you know, we're, and, and Allison, let me, let me know if I'm wrong here. I mean, we're tripling the, uh, the availability of options for, for the kids uh, in the seventh and eighth grade levels and so we're really moving into that whole pathway piece so this this plan allows that to happen um, we had to add some teaching uh, to, specifically for the electives but also as we looked at literacy across all three middle schools and then the the um, face piece or the uh, yeah the face piece let's call it that uh, yes thank you <laughs> uh, and then we also added then the high school health the board asked us to uh, with a good recommendation from the principals to add in a requirement for high school health. And that is important because at middle school, we, we do the health there, but we all know that things change so dramatically as we grow up. Um, we needed, we felt a strong urge and need to put that in the, in the high schools. And then finally, that exploring world language component, as we looked at, uh, we're expanding our options for, for our experiences uh, with the world languages piece. So kids will get a better broad view of, of the languages and culture of different languages. So, so this is what that plan provides, and that's why you see uh, the majority of the increase at the middle school. All right, so brass tacks, right? We get down to what, what's this plan cost us? Uh, we've done some fine tuning. We sharpened the pencils today, and the difference between this year's staffing budget and next year's staffing budget is actually uh, we're, we're saving, currently we're, we're down $76,252, meaning it's that much less than it was uh, this year. So the proposed plan 
it also includes uh, what we call three contingencies. We're al always going to name it uh, a dollar amount because if you recall, we used to say three contingencies and then we'd say, well, position for position. But if, if uh, what you're going to hear me say at the board meeting is it's going to be $75,193 times three, which is roughly $225,000 and change. And that allows me that amount of money to use contingencies wherever I need to, whether that's one overload at the high school or uh, a section at the middle school, or maybe it's a, a, an FT at the elementary because enrollment grew so much. Um, but you'll you'll see that. And, and historically, uh, we have used all that money every, every year I've been here. And I know when Dr. Sperry was here, they used that quite a bit too. So uh, that always comes in with that. And this total includes the contingency plan. Uh, as I talked about, I think we've hit on all of these different pieces, the retirements and resignations, open enrollment. We don't know how many kids we might get to open enroll, so that's why we have contingencies. If we get an influx of students, you know, good for us. We have contingency money to, to pay for the extra teacher or staff that it might need. Uh, and then any un unforeseen circumstances. We might have some move out, move in. Typically, we're kind of neutral that way, but you never know. So that's why we have those variable factors. I wanted to make sure we highlight it. Uh, and this is also, this is extremely important. Um, with the changes of, of the HR staff, uh, we needed a little bit more time this year. Normally I would have presented it at the first board meeting in March, but we just weren't ready. And I don't want to present you something that's not complete. So uh, we had to wait till the March 26th board meeting. We're going to give you our first round. You guys are, most of you are going to be hearing it now. You'll hear it again on March 26th. Um, Hopefully you, you'll approve the plan. Uh, and then what we'll do is that meeting that I talked about getting all the principals together and doing the shifting as we need to, to help prevent non-renewals as much as possible. Uh, either way, we're gonna have to meet prior to the April 9th meeting because that is the last possible meeting we can have uh, for the staffing plan. If we have to non-renew someone, we have to know that night. And we have to, you have to, as board, has to, have to approve the preliminary non-renewal notice. And then May 14th is when we give a final, this is per state statute, a final non-renewal notice to anyone who may be non-renewed. And so we literally have to deliver it the next day to that person. And if, so I just want you to be aware that, I hate to put you, you know, it's kind of like a crunch timeline, but that's what the state statutes force us to do. So I believe that is, oh, I have to say thank you, of course, to everyone, uh, everyone in the district who's been involved with this, Lord knows the directors have heard me talk about this a lot. Uh, we've done a lot of work with the middle school and high schools, elementary principals, all the principals. Um, Mandy Harper, again, just jumping on board and, and really working through a lot of things. And Michelle Call has really been helpful as well with as we transition. She's answered a lot of our questions that we have. Um, but again, you know, we've got uh, Angela Lynch, uh, Kim Perenboom, who works with the special ed staffing, Julia DeCook. Uh, there's several others that they're intricately involved in this piece that we put together. So now, questions. Thank you. You may have answered it, but one of the things I, I keep hearing throughout it, it comes as a surprise that their job may be gone. And I realize that we as a district <clears throat> have to have something that allows us to do good planning. But I think an individual needs something. And I'm kind of looking at something that may be called, and maybe you're already doing it in a different way, what I call a soft and hard landing. A preliminary soft landing so that the district has theirs, but also those employees that very well could be affected would have that opportunity to say, ooh, I wasn't expecting this. Or I thought it may be, but I wasn't sure. So you get that where you get together and start discussing with the employees, the district does. You're on this maybe short list. I don't know how to word it in a, in a nice way uh, with it. And I think Commissioner Thompson mentioned, it. isn't there something in between that we could do to allow this to happen so we're not shocking good teachers or whatever or people that work throughout the district? Mm -hmm. It isn't just teachers. So. It's just a suggestion, and you may be doing that. I'm just not picking up on it. Sure. Uh, to just quickly address your, your comments, um, we, we 
it, there's a fine line um, between causing unnecessary stress for people and um, making sure that they're aware. Um, so we, we do, it's, it's always a fine line. One could argue we should wait. One could argue that we shouldn't wait. Um, at, at, I, I do know that people are aware of, of their, the possible reductions at this time. Um, I also know that at the elementary, you can pretty much see if, if you're, you're a third grade teacher and your second grade has 45 kids and you've got three sections, you can bet that as that rolls up, somebody, there's going to be a section gone. It's just a matter of how that looks. And, and, and I can guarantee you, and at least in my experience, I know principals talk to those grade levels to say, hey, just so you know, it looks like we're going to be sectioned down. I want you to start thinking about that. And that, you know, no one's specific, but just to let, let people know. There's always that fine line and that you have to find. So, and, um, the timeline for notification of retirement, we moved up a couple months or whatever that was. Yes. And I, I thought um, the intent was so that we can approve the staffing plan as early as possible. Mm -hmm. Therefore, giving those individuals that may get a uh, notice of non-renewal time. We don't want to lay, nobody likes to be late to mm -hmm. tell somebody laid off or whatever. Right. Gives them the optimum time to go out and find work because right now school districts across the, not just the state but the nation are out there competing for the best talent. And the sooner the Janesville School District can, can approve our staffing plan and work through all those things, we can affect the best options. Absolutely. Is that kind of... That's exactly right. So then that, though, leads me to um, the history here. You know, it wasn't that long ago we had 100 yes. notifications of non-renewal. 100. And at that time, we had this debate on how that works. But it was more concrete because it was contract language, mm -hmm. I think. Still, it was yes, and then we've over time we've had this um, healthy debate on what does seniority mean? Is seniority important? You know, and I look at it more like more of a uh, job experience because seniority, the public thinks seniority, they think it's a cliche that comes from the union that's strictly based on how long you've been here, right? And I think we've moved away from that. Uh, but so I, I more I look at it more like job experience. And just bear with me. And mm -hmm. as a paramedic, you know, when I was uh, ten years on the ambulance as a paramedic, I, a new person would ride with me. Right? She said, "Come out of school," and they knew her. they knew a lot. Right? Mm -hmm. Probably more than I did at certain things that I forgot. But when you're in the street, you want that person with experience there because I've seen this. I've done that. I know what that is. I don't have to go through my playbook and determine, you know, what's going on. And I kind of look at that as the uh, art of a teacher too. So that was my idealistic kind of soapbox about that. But my question is then, how does a board of nine affect change in a handbook? It's not policy, which we know we can change or add or subtract policy, but so what's the mechanism if the boards wanted to say, well, geez, we need a little more detail about recall layoff, those three conditions. How does the board go about doing that? That's an excellent question. So really that would have to go to the full board for a discussion and uh, some direction collectively from, from the entire board because you know, you'd be asking for a board action really. Um, and so, that's where it would have to come from. So would it be a more of a consensus discussion or would it be actually a... Well, it would be probably more along the lines of... Directing administration yeah, to do something. Yeah, to do and something and to, and to make some changes in the handbook to reflect that, right? So we usually come to the board on a quarterly-ish basis mm -hmm. with um, potential revisions to the handbook and the board does approve that. Um, and so it would have to get embedded into that process. And then the board, if there were certain things you did or didn't want in that language, 
you know, you, you'd have to give us some guidance and we'd go back and work on that and frankly vet it through the, through our, uh, the attorney. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we have some language that we've been putzing around with just a little bit and we actually did send it to the attorney to vet it through. Um, we just got that back today, literally, like midday. Um, so you, you can see I have a couple of marked up red pages here that I'm holding around this issue. And so, but at the end of the day, we really need not for one or two board members to tell us that's what you want us to do. We need the board to speak as a, as a governing body. Thanks. Any other comments? Yes, yes Commissioner Thompson. Can you clarify again the timetable? Now we're going to be missing two excellent commissioners at the next meeting. The best. <laughs> I'll be here. <laughs> uh, so are you asking for approval next time, or are you going to simply give us? No, I will be asking you for your approval at the next meeting. Uh, we will get the plan, the details of the plan to you probably tomorrow. Mandy was just putting it together to make sure we had it all. We want to make sure it's all accurate and complete for you so you can look through all the detail. I gave you the, uh, the important notes today so you know the gist of what this big thick book is going to say, but you can certainly have access to the detail as well. I guess I look at it this way. We really approved this process this fall when we we said we approved the current policy because that drives the staffing plan. And then it's, then it's just a matter of administration and the principals simply, you know, doing the math. But technically we have to, we'll be asked to approve this uh, March 26. Do you understand? You know what I mean? If we really wanted to affect the staffing plan, it's it's the policy that makes the change, not the work. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, so again, we we followed, as I said earlier in my presentation, we followed the board's policy that I presented to you as board uh, staffing assumptions in November, which is also on here. So, um, so that's true. And I, I, uh, I really appreciate, uh, your plan and I'm sorry that I'm not going to be at the next meeting. Um, but, uh, but I, I mean, I'm, I'm just expressing my opinion and desire here that I would like to see, um, some place, uh, for a recognition of the contribution that people have made here for many years in and we can, Sit down and define what's. I know, I know, you know. I know that that's policy. You know, we approved the policy already, um, but uh, but I'm looking for some changes that recognizes the experience and the dedication that people have had to this um, to this district. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it used to be it used to be it was pretty much it felt like it was straight seniority. You know. And uh, pretty cut and dry um, with other things like licensure and everything else. And I don't know that I want to go back to totally straight seniority. I don't, be, and to be perfectly honest, because I don't like the attitude people have about teachers when that is there. Because then the then the attitude people get is that well they got their jobs and it's you know and it's there's nothing that can be done and um, and I really think that it taints the perception of uh, teachers um, um, unwarrantedly, honestly. And so I, but I think that there's a place for some recognition of people's dedication to this district in this policy. And I would really like to see um, the administration and the JEA um, think about what that is and where it could be. I really do. So based on the superintendent, is, they've done some work on this because they heard this was coming to uh, lay off and recall. And I, I guess I see this as a future board agenda item so we can have that discussion about how we affect the handbook language. So we can do that. If I, if I may, just I want to make an important note. So that part of my presentation tonight was 
based on your wish to include it all, I will not have that piece uh, as part of the staffing plan presentation because it really doesn't, the staffing plan is about the numbers and the policy, um, but that is, like you said, Commissioner Murray, a separate agenda item. Okay. Oh, there we go. Um, I love the idea of you letting them know in February early. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that is great for the, for the staff and for administration. So you don't want to taint what you're doing. I would think you would want to go that extra mile and possibly work on some sort of language for seniority or um, for their work ethic or whatever you want to call it. You can call it whatever you want, you know, but... I definitely agree with everyone else that that is something that the board should look at. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Okay. And, um, and, but it looks like you're not done yet. I'm not done yet, <laughs> okay. but I'm, I'll sit down for this part. Okay. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Okay, what you have in front of you, and I wouldn't expect you to read it now, um, but you have uh, in front of you an example uh, of a job description for what we call coordinator of athletics. One of the things that we've um, seen is an increasing need for this position. I've seen it personally because athletics currently falls under my responsibility. And uh, what I tend to, to see, and, and Superintendent Pufal and I have had many conversations, is that it athletics um, the high schools and the middle schools currently have ADs at the school at the site and they do a great job of, of coordinating but we really need uh, we feel a position who can someone who can actually see a vision for the district in terms of facility needs for fundraising um, for hiring coaches for doing codes all of those di different pieces someone who can encapsulate all that responsibility and focus only in athletics and, and create um, really a, a nice community of support for Janesville. Uh, in my current position, and it's very frank, it, um, it's more of a reactive situation. I deal with things that come up versus trying to prevent those things that come up. We have a, we have a code, and again, we have wonderful staff that, that work on those things. But this is just something that, uh, as we look to the future, uh, we used to have this position in the district uh, for many, many years. We, we did, as a result of um, budget cuts, uh, re remove this position from, from the staff about 10 years ago. Uh, and since then, um, it's been under the guise of the director of HR or me, the assistant superintendent, um, responsibility for that. So again, I think there is an increasing need to see that uh, someone that can carry the torch for athletics on a full-time basis, someone who can go out to the community, uh, the businesses, and to advocate for what we're doing in Janesville, because we are doing some great things, who can tell that story uh, to anyone who will listen and, that, uh, and who can help coordinate and, and again, make Janesville a force um, for in the Big Eight, you know, essentially. And so I'm just, again, this is going to be a position that I'm just putting in front of you. It's not an ask. It's something for you to consider. I want you to look it over, um, give us feedback, questions that you might have, things that, you know, homework that you might want us to do. This would be one of those pieces that goes up as we look at our budget. This is just, again, one of those things to consider. Another thing for you to consider as we look at all those different budget priorities um, that we have. Um, so on my list, this is an action item. Is that, was that, was it supposed to be? It, it can be. We put it as an action item because we weren't sure, you know, where, where the board was going to go with it. I suspect that we're probably just going to have a discussion and we're just trying to get some feedback okay. and get this on your radar. And then like Scott said, it'll get built into the budget process. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I, I wasn't sure. Want to have the flexibility to do it either way. I know we can't make it an action item if we don't list it that way, but we can choose not to take action if it's listed that way. So, 
Thank you. I, I guess obvious one question I you know is is uh, that I didn't see the memo or maybe I just missed it. But where where in the salary schedule would this be placed? Is this a directorship? No, this is a coordinator position. Coordinator so, position. Uh, okay. It would be commensurate with a coordinator salary, which there's a range at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it depends on 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 the person's experience and such, but anywhere between seventy five eighty thousand to ninety ish. Okay. So, Thank you. Any other questions? Um, so I heard you say this is full time, and I um, I know the Craig AD, and I know it's a very full time role. Does Parker have an AD right now? They do. Okay. Clayton Krieger. Okay, thank you. I mm -hmm. thought I couldn't remember where that left off. I apologize. So what happens to the current people holding an AD title? Uh, at this point, this is all preliminary, but what right. we foresee, and when I did my research, uh, I didn't just grab this out of the air. I did some research with all the other uh, similar districts to our size. Mm -hmm. um, they have point people at each of the buildings. They still have building ADs, but they have one person that all the ADs report to as an athletic coordinator that coordinates the athletic programs. Um, we'll still need those people in the, in the buildings. The level at which we need them might fluctuate depending on how things move forward. So if I heard you right, each, the buildings and just high schools would have an AD who would report to? Middle schools as well. Middle schools as well. Yep, yep. We currently have three ADs at the middle okay. schools too. Okay. So they could, that would stay, but then they would report to like a single central district AD. Yes. So Chris Nicholson is currently the, the athletic secretary. I'm technically the district AD. Okay, and then um, one question I did get brought up to me by a parent is, should an AD be able to coach? Would this central AD? No, this yeah. person would be strictly um, coordinating athletics. That, that would be their full-time job, no coaching. They would hire coaches and they would supervise, but they would not coach. But building ADs could stay coaching. That's yet to, yeah, at That's this, at this probably, point. Up to the central? Yes. Okay. And, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but um, building ADs are just a part-time position, right? They are still teaching. That is correct. And being, okay. Both so at it's the not high school like, and middle school. And that would obviously continue, that the building ADs would continue to teach part-time but have this extra duty. That is correct. Okay. I'm um, at the high schools. I know one of the ads is a is a assistant principal, right? No, isn't it? Oh no, okay. nope. That no, we used to have that structure. Yeah, we no longer do. Oh, okay. No, okay. they're teachers. <clears throat> if this position were to occur, mm -hmm. could that person, in an extreme emergency, take over a coaching position temporarily? Mm -hmm. Or would you fill it otherwise? It's I think a, we would fill it otherwise. Other, I, I, I really don't think that would happen. Okay. Uh, again, I'm just uh, speculating, but we wouldn't want our coordinator to do that. We would we so, would find a sub. So as I speculated. Yeah. So appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Again, this is just uh, putting it on your radar kind of thing. Is it possible that, for example, high school ADs, they do a certain percentage classroom and a percentage AD, that that percentage could change where they would be back in the classroom more and less as the AD and some of that offset could monetarily help pay for correct this possible position, position it right? could ha yes it, it could happen could. at this point obviously we're right okay we don't know that level but that could happen so one more question the this is common around among districts this size that they would we would just Yes. I'm putting probably a lot on the other. <laughs> yes. Uh, to, to be perfectly honest, um, and I don't believe I'm misspeaking here, but most most districts our size have actually full-time ADs at each of the high schools. Oh. So, yeah. This is still an interim proposal. The district I came from, for example, would be an example of that. We had one high school. We had a full-time athletic director. That's the norm, frankly. And my high school is a one building uh, district and it has an AD. Right. Yeah. And, so and for a while is, it had two. We're, we're not even coming close to shooting for the stars with this proposal. We're just 
doing what I think we minimally need to do to start properly running our athletic programs. And I think to make people understand, Scott, so let's go down the list. You hire co coaches, you schedule, right? So the ADs currently are doing that. Okay. Piece of it. I, I actually do hire, I approve the hires. Okay. The what hires about like me. facilities and all that kind of stuff? What kinds of things do you deal with in that respect? So we know how big the job is. Currently it's, um, it's not where we want it to be. I, I, I work with contracts uh, and then I present those to Superintendent Pufal and Keith to sign the contracts in terms of negotiations with either the city or youth baseball, football, you name it. We work on those. I'm in charge of that, uh, working with those. I'm, all the codes, uh, the, the appeals on that, working with the athletic code itself. Um, but again, really, the, I think the focus we really have to think about is facility needs, um, looking at what our long-range long, long range capital facility needs would be for athletics, what our fund, fundraising um, Possibility. There's a lot of possibilities with that, as I as I see it. We've discussed that, that just aren't being touched right now. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Um, so we have the option of making it an action item. I don't know if we need to make it an action item. Let me try to summarize. Okay. I feel like there was a sense of, yeah, this is a pretty good idea. We should continue to move this forward and mm -hmm. further develop, you know, what it might look like and um, embed it into the possibility of being approved as part of, uh, of the upcoming budget cycle. And obviously it will have to compete with everything else that's going to be in the budget cycle, you know, for limited resources. But nonetheless, that I'm hearing based on the comment that, just occurred in this discussion that we should continue um, to, to move this work forward. I think so. And, and um, I mean, we can do an action item if you want the seal of approval um, on it. Um, but, um, but you know, is it, it's going, is it going through the, the, um, the finance committee too? Will it go there too? Well, it will eventually once we take a budget proposal to okay. them, not necessarily as a standalone item, but it'll get embedded into the draft budget proposal for the upcoming school year. Okay. Okay. Well, I tell you what, why don't we do an action item just so that we've got it. Okay. But I need a motion in a second. A motion. Uh, I'll make the motion. I move to I move this proposal to the recommendation on the full board. Do I have a second? Is that correct? Okay. We got a motion and a second. And we've already had our discussion. Last chance. Okay, seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. There you go. Thank you. Uh, and announcements and updates. I don't have anything. Um, Superintendent, you don't have anything either? Not right now. Other than do you want to set a date for um, the next meeting? That would be the only yep. thing we and could take a look at. You bet. So let's see here. We usually do like the third Monday of the month. Um, that does push us to April 15th. That's just, that's not, yeah, so that's not good. Um, is, uh, how does Monday, um, now Monday, April 22nd is, it would mean that we have this meeting and then we have a school board meeting the next day. I don't know if that is a problem for anybody. There's no board meeting that night. Oh, there isn't. There's only one in April. Okay. Because of spring break. Okay, there you go. So I, I don't know why that's on my calendar. So uh, so how does Monday, April 22nd at 4.30 look? Good. Good? Okay, let's lock it in. So Monday, April 22nd, 4.30. All right, we've reached the end of our agenda. We are adjourned. Thank you.